Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, so in this video, I'd like to talk about the importance of distress psychology in NPD, okay? In this sense, I think I'd like to encourage people to consider that maybe um, some of the fundamental psychology of NPD is probably not unrelated to what we see like in phobias, okay? Like phobias, people who are terrified of spiders or terrified of getting on an airplane, you know, that, that really intense um, psychology. And I'd like to think of that as being kind of like a distress, like a distress psychology. OK, so I think um, one of the things we see in NPD is a lot of like aversions. OK, a lot of times we think that the arrogance and the kind of the haughtiness and the sort of um, just the kind of um, snobbiness of the NPD sort of sort of is born by itself. OK, but it may be that it's sort of like a result of sort of eliminating eliminating certain uh, information uh, and sort of like filtering information. So we only filter information that's sort of associated with like high class things, being like high class, being like, um, you know, looking down on people. But that just may be the result of kind of like a phobia that sort of like screens out from our, let's say our processing of the environment, sort of screens out material that's related to like see middle class, average kind of, um, I don't know, like like being lost in mediocrity, things like that, that there's almost like a phobic um, blockage. So you're not processing information that, say, is part of, um, let's say, the full spectrum of our environment. And you're only processing information that sort of reinforces sort of an identification with more upper class or more. Um, if it's not social class, it's sort of like, you know, being around elite people or, you know, people who are not mediocre, basically. OK. So if we look at this as being kind of like the result of like a kind of a phobia and then it's sort of like selective processing of information. So you sort of are only processing information that that's sort of um, related to, let's say, not being mediocre. OK, but just to understand that, I think it's possible that the um, the arrogance and um, the haughtiness, sort of the, the snobbiness of NPD may fundamentally come from how we process information in our environment and that selective processing may come from a distress psychology which is almost like a, a phobia of things that are like mediocre and you know or just like being lost in in uh, an anonymity basically um so you know and that's hard to explain for each person because i think a lot of people are not afraid of being say lost in anonymity okay a lot of people are not afraid of being mediocre because maybe they've learned to live in a situation where they, they don't really stand out and in a way that's almost a comfort zone for some people you know even in my life as i've sort of recovered been in the process of recovering from mpd i have found even some some comfort in mediocrity it's sort of a comfortable place to be when you learn to inhabit mediocrity you know um, or just sort of being lost in the averageness of just being an average person, even like a, a, an invisible person. You know, I've, I've found certain comfort, but I can say that um, maybe for some people when they're young and depending on the family dynamics, maybe certain families do not reward people for being invisible and mediocre. Maybe in some families there, there's a... Um, kind of a, an atmosphere where being mediocre is, is terrible. You know, that's a one possibility. The other possibility is you could grow up in a family where there's no problem with being mediocre, but maybe because of one's own temperament and maybe one's own experiences, let's say in school, let's say um, you're in like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and let's say you're getting bullied a lot or you're getting uh, teased a lot and, and you're perceiving uh, in, in your classmates that being mediocre is like the worst thing, you know, and that only the popular kids or the good looking kids are, are worth anything and the rest are just kind of, you know, whatever. It's hard to explain, but I think for different people, um, you come to a place in life, whether it's from the family or from the friends in your neighborhood or maybe uh, classmates in school or just something in the environment where you start to develop like a phobia, the way some people have a phobia of like spiders the way some people have a phobia of eating fish with bones, you know, some people are really turned off by onions, you know, it, it makes it really, maybe it's not a phobia, but it, it's disgusting, you know, and it's sort of like a disgust reaction where you're disgusted and it's like a, a phobic reaction. It's like a distress 
a distress psychology around, let's say, the predicament of being lost in mediocrity, being, let's say, invisible, lost in the crowd, whatever. It may be in some ways similar to being like abandoned. You know what I mean? Like like lost in the crowd, like the, like you have nothing to hold on to. It's sort of like a vertigo and you, you don't have any like way to defend yourself, you know? And you start to believe, you, you form very young age, you form uh, sort of a, a belief that only by standing out and by being, let's like, say, exceptional, can you sort of acquire, let's say, security. Okay, so this has to do with not feeling secure and, and feeling like you don't have bearings, you don't have, let's like, say, orientation, unless you have something you can hold on to, which is being, let's like, say, you know, extraordinary. Now, I just want to say, first of all, you know, there is some truth to this because as I've seen in life, okay, whenever it comes to any kind of job, okay, or any kind of career or any kind of like, say, academic, um, you know, like say academic programs, often it is true that the people who really stand out are the ones who have more security, okay? And people who don't stand out so much, even like say in a corporation, like I used to work in an insurance company. And I remember that, you know, um, the people who really did well in the insurance company were people who were always competing at a very high level and always sort of standing out. Those are the people who got promoted. And even people who got to a management position, if they didn't really stand out and really perform, they would sort of disappear, you know. So I think in some ways, um, this instinct that we have is probably does reflect a little bit the reality in the world that you do have to kind of stand out and you do have to be sort of exceptional in order to have security, in order, in order not to risk, let's say, just being marginalized, you know, and even people who seem mediocre, people who just have an average job, like, oh, that's the guy he works as a manager of a Wendy's, you know, whatever. We don't realize that to be a manager of a Wendy's, <laughs> you actually have to be pretty exceptional <laughs> because lots of people go through the Wendy's and they, they might even get to supervisor, but to get to manager, you know, you have to really stand out. So even even in public, what seem like average anonymous people, when you put the microscope on them, they may have some pretty exceptional qualities, which explains why they're able to be, let's say, a sergeant in the military as opposed to just being a, a regular corporal or a private. You know what I mean? Like even just to make regular buck sergeant, you know, in, in the army, you have to be a little bit exceptional, you know? Or even to be like, say, an auto mechanic, you know, you look at auto mechanics and think, ah, oh, he's just an auto mechanic. But to actually be a successful auto mechanic, you have to be pretty good, you know. So I think a lot of things that we we process as being mediocre or middle class, actually, you know, to be even remotely successful and to have any real security in the world, you do have to be a little bit um, exceptional, you know. And I guess that's just one of the, call that one of the hard realities of, of our life, you know. So... I'm not trying to say that it's not true. It's not, it isn't true that you have to be somewhat exceptional in life in, in some area. Okay. It is actually kind of true. Okay. I think where the problem comes for the NPD is the distress around that truth. Okay. And that distress psychology creates a distortion in how we process information. Okay. Because we, we, we become almost like phobic, phobic, almost like uh, alarm. Like we get into like a distress mode around certain realities of life, you know, and then because of that distress, it's like, we're so disgusted by the concept of mediocrity, you know, and how, how that makes us feel that we might be lost in, you know, without orientation, without security, basically that we almost just can't tolerate it. And it becomes disgusting for us. Okay. And we really develop a, a disgust around mediocrity. Okay. Now, there may be other reasons for that too, you know, at least in my family, my dad had a real bad attitude about like, say certain types of social classes and whatever, even, even I found that kind of irritating. I thought, God, that's not very nice of my dad. He could be a little more humane, you know, but I think somehow in my family, I also picked up a little bit of cultural kind of um, looking down on certain people, you know, and I'm not sure if at the bottom, bottom of that, is maybe a sense that I don't want to identify with those people, or maybe those people are just how, how, how you would look at people as being like, say, disgusting. You know, I remember, um, I didn't have this problem myself, but I, I used to have friends who, who would make comments. Like you would drive through a bad neighborhood and they say, Oh, this place is so ghetto. This is so ghetto. It's like so trashy, you know? And I think, um, maybe we should look at the psychology of why we feel that disgust, you know, um, 
you know, like maybe around homeless people, let's say, you know, obviously homeless people, they have hygiene problems, you know, and they're, they're drug addicted and they may be involved in crime. And there is sort of a, a dirtiness, you might say, to, to the way they live. But to be so disgusted, you know, not everybody is that disgusted. You may you may see a homeless person and you may you may think that person is dirty, but it doesn't like like um, provoke a person necessarily to have like a uh, like a, a distress reaction. You know what I'm saying? It could just be, well, he's dirty. You know, it, it doesn't have to be like to the alarm level, you know, but I think at least in some people, um, it may be partly due to the fear of identifying with mediocrity. It may be the disgust, like disgust with um, things that are not hygienic or not clean or chaotic, or even like I've seen people who get a lot of resentment towards people who are kind of low class and sort of criminal, like, oh, they're just criminals. They're just doing drugs. They're dirty, you know, but it's, it's not, instead of just seeing it and just observing it, there's like a disgust reaction, you know, it's like, it makes you disgusted. So I think, um, you know, part of it may be, um, you know, like I said, you know, kind of like maybe uh, the fear of identifying with like, say, um, mediocrity in the sense that in mediocrity, you don't have security. That may be part of it. But I think part of it may also just be um, maybe not having enough contact with people of different social status and then just having a disgust reaction around things that you're not familiar with. OK, and then it becomes a habit and you sort of get stuck in sort of like associating disgust with things that are dirty just because you don't have any experience with that, you know, but it develops. And uh, just like a person could have developed like a disgust around onions, around uh, certain types of fish with bones or fish that fish that tastes like fish, you know, just all these, we, we have like a, the ability to form, like say a disgust with certain things, you know? And so I think these are kind of like distress psychologies basically. And, um, and I think when, whenever we get into anything that has a distress, like a distress psychology, I think that can, that can, uh, get to a point where we start filtering information where we, we don't like to process information around things that are really disgusting. Like, Oh, I don't want to see that. I don't want to deal with that. And so very, very slowly, all the information we process, we sort of filter it and we only process information or we only give a lot of attention to information that is sort of consonant with, like, say, higher class, things that are cleaner, things that are more hygienic, um, things that are neater, you know, more tidy. And then let's say in the world of like, say, just like, say, the, the socioeconomic, um, you know, world, basically people who are more exceptional, you know, maybe not so interested in people that are just average or mediocre, or you might even develop like an like an irritation around mediocrity, where mediocrity really annoys a person, you know, where you start to feel real frustrated and annoyed with anything that's like mediocre. And so what will end up happening if, if it's not it's not the fact that, that it could be a problem to me be mediocre. Yes. In the, in the world, it is a problem to be mediocre, okay? And it is a problem also to be homeless or to be drug addicted or to be dirty or to be ghetto. It is a problem. Um, you know, socioeconomic poverty is a, is a problem. But the problem is, is do we have a distress in our perception of those things, okay? Just like the person who says, oh, I can't go to medical school. I got good grades in biology, but I can't stand blood. Blood makes me want to pass out that's a distress psychology. You see, a person can, who could be very good in biology, they could actually pass all the tests, they could probably go to medical school academically, and even they might even have good bedside manner, they might know how to treat people, they might know how to make people feel comfortable, but they just have that one thing where they can't be around blood because that that's a, like a distress reaction. So, you know, why is a person af afraid of blood? I mean, in the end, I can I can speculate, you know, that maybe there may be some reasons why people are, like, say, disgusted by mediocrity. It may have something to do with feeling insecure. Um, at least in my case, when I think about mediocrity, it makes me feel insecure. OK, but that doesn't explain why I might have uh, I might have been a little bit um, infected by, let's say, my father's attitude towards, let's say, people of a certain social class, you know. And I think that probably just came through the family and maybe lack of experience, lack of lack of uh, experience with different social, social classes when I was younger. OK, now I'm, I'm much better now, but I'm just saying when I was younger, um, maybe I just didn't have enough experience with different types of people. And I, I kind of picked up attitudes from my parents and sort of I, I was sort of infected by, like, say, kind of a disgust towards certain things. And then maybe some of it just could be genetic and also lack of experience. You know, like some people spontaneously 
they can't stand broccoli, they can't stand onions, they can't stand fish with bones. And I mean, you would really have to condition them to get them out of that, that natural reaction. Like some people just, it's, it may just be a little bit temperamental, you know, but we should have, we should be very careful because, um, it's not a problem necessarily to be a little bit turned off by someone who's dirty or a little turned off by like, say certain types of foods. The thing is, is that certain people have a very distress reaction around those things. Okay. And if it's distressing enough, you're going to start filtering information and you're not going to fully process the information in your environment from people of different social classes, from people of different abilities. Okay. And you're going to treat people who have different abilities, like maybe not so nice because you can't really process the reality of, of their situation because it turns you off and they're going to pick up on that distress reaction, which may include being disgusted. Okay. And then slowly that develops into an attitude an attitude of looking down with disgust on certain people, you know? So I'm just suggesting that, um, as we look into, uh, you know, what is NPD, there may be some kind of phobic kind of distress, sort of phobic distress, sort of, uh, distress type psychologies that are going on that have to do with how we form our attitude about certain things in the world. Okay. And that in the end, it's not fundamentally that someone is being snobby or haughty or, or being uh, arrogant. It may be fundamentally that there are some blocks in the filtration of processing information in the environment where what's going on in that, in that blockage is like a distress state where you're really disgusted by things. Okay. So I think if someone has NPD or is struggling with NPD, or if you're trying to be patient with somebody who has NPD, you might just want to consider that maybe fundamentally with that person or in yourself, if you're struggling, that there may be like um, a level of phobic disgust, okay, around certain things, okay? Now, why that is, it probably, in a sense, doesn't even matter why, okay? It may be a little bit how we're raised. It may be a little bit our temperament. It may be lack of experience. But it, after a while, it becomes sort of like part of who we are, you know what I mean? And so regardless of why it's there, it develops into sort of like a structure of our personality. And I'm just saying the, the hang up and, and the difficulty and the, the barrier, I think, for a lot of us is that at the bottom of our bad attitude towards the world, OK, there may be a little bit of a phobic disgust, kind of distress psychology. All right. And so whenever there's any kind of distress in the mind, OK, I think that's very challenging because that's almost like a piece of the mind. that's almost like a wild animal. OK. And the sort of like say the the substance of distress the the psychological substance of distress may inherently have a lot of rage a lot of um loathsomeness a lot of loathing a very intense emotion okay now you, we may not actually feel that emotion but it's part of the screen that we put up and sort of screening information where we don't we don't like certain things okay and so we just need to be careful even though, though we don't feel the rage and we don't feel the disgust um, all the time. It may par be part of the screen, the sort of screening and filtering information. And just be aware that, you know, even though we don't feel it, there may be sort of a wild, sort of a feral energy state going on. And, and we may be capable of more, may we may be connected to more rage and loathing than we realize. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of like the state to me of dealing like with wild animals. And so it requires a lot of patience, okay? Because there's a part of our brain that's maybe kind of activated to like a distress level. Okay. Even though it's sort of dissociated, it's still part of us. And so I think that, um, as we deal with things in life that make us feel like that, that sort of rouse our disgust or touch, press our buttons where we start feeling disgust. I think as we get better, we need to sort of reapproach those areas. We have to, because, uh, you know, we have to first encounter where we get disgusted. And then just like someone who's getting over a phobia, we have to kind of get over the phobia, you know? And, uh, you know, just in an intelligent way, not, not being stupid, like not going, going to some bad neighborhood and just not taking, not protecting ourselves, but like we need to slowly sort of encounter subject matter that would normally make us disgusted and sort of reaccustom ourselves, sort of, sort of like re recondition ourselves so that we, we can start to learn to encounter the disgust reactions or the, or even like the despair reactions, but these distressing reactions, which can produce a lot of what even can even feel like depression can feel like, um, you, you know, you have like, say when I imagine, let's say going back to certain cities that I've lived in, okay. Where I've had very bad experiences. All right. And I try to imagine going back to those cities and maybe just being a, an anonymous person that, that pushes a button for me where I feel so 
I feel so uh, disoriented, like, like I don't even know who I am and I don't know how I'm going to make a living and I feel so insecure and it's so deep. It's almost like I almost become almost psychotic, you know? So I think we have to be very patient and just slowly reapproach those frontiers, the, you know, areas that, that really rouse our distress psychology. Okay. And re reapproach and recondition ourselves to, to address the realities of, let's say, being anonymous, mediocre, let's say the, the world of the ghetto, the things that are not hygienic, things that are not upper class, things that are not, um, you know, things that are not like, um, I don't know, how do you say like, like superior, basically, you know, things that are just average or even below average. And we have to really, um, you know, kind of reapproach the, the parts of that that really push our buttons and then just kind of have patience because it's going to feel like crap. You know, it's going to feel like crap, but just understand that there is a part of us that can get very distressed. Okay. And we have to, I believe, you know, take the trouble to just recondition and just learn to relive our lives with those terrible feelings. Okay. And then slowly, hopefully, as we become more acquainted and we develop more conditioning with those distress, re distress reactions, just like people can get over phobias over time, you know, if they, if they work on it, you know, and this may be something similar to like cognitive behavioral therapy or, you know, I think CBT, right. But, you know, whatever we have to do just to go in small steps and kind of, kind of like re recondition ourselves to deal with the things in the world that, that produce our distress reactions, our disgust reactions. Okay. So that we can start to filter all the information in our environment, not just the things that are associated with, say, um, being superior, being upper class, being, um, you know, really, let's say, like really hygienic or, you know, whatever, all the information, everything around us, not just the nice things. You know what I mean? And I think that will slowly deflate our uh, arrogance and our, you know, uh, high class attitude or whatever, looking down on people. I think it, it just takes time. And I think we, instead of trying to change the attitude directly, I think it's better to, to focus on how we're selecting information in our environment and sort of reconfront and readapt ourselves and condition ourselves to the, the things that push our buttons associated with say mediocrity, let's say um, not standing out, just being average and invisible, you know, all those things that push our buttons we need to go to the places that push our buttons, including even the stuff about being below average. Okay. And then just kind of reacquaint ourselves with that subject matter and the feelings we have and slowly readapt ourselves. And so that's very painful. And I would say it's about on the level of, let's say, recovering from like a heroin addiction. Okay. Because our brain is already programmed. Okay. And so just like a heroin addict may take years to retune their brain. I think we have to set ourselves, you know, through patience just to, to expect the, the recovery to be a, a question of years, potentially. But I'd like say every few weeks, every month, we can we can move one step on the path, you know. And so if we look at, um, you know, reacquainting, reacquainting ourselves or, or familiarizing ourselves or getting conditioned with, like, say, things that are very upsetting, distressing. If we can just take it in small pieces and just try to advance maybe, you know, half a mile or, you know, 200 yards per day whatever, or per week, you know, over time that will add up. And I think, you know, you look at it as like, like you go into the gym, you know, you're not going to lift 300 pounds in one day. You have to sort of work, work and develop uh, conditioning, you know, so that if we can just look at uh, NPD recovery is just, you know, identifying areas where we need to get, let's say, um, acquainted with things that, that really push our buttons. Okay. And then address those things and slowly, slowly in small steps become adapted and condition to be able to handle information that normally would make us really upset, you know? So each of us has to sort of develop, I think, a plan to, you know, small steps, just kind of um, address, let's say the, the phobia, call it, you know, the stuff that, that causes us to have distress reactions. And then, you know, and for me, I can tell you, you know, I consider myself to have some recovery, but I still struggle with this. And there are certain things that really bother me in the world. And it's hard for me, you know, to be, I don't like to feel distressed. I don't like to feel like, like upset that, that, that to me, that interferes with my life. But I think, you know, any good recovery has to in, involve, you know, sort of accepting a certain amount of turbulence, a certain amount of even psychic violence and learning how to tolerate it and sort of hold it and process it. And I think over time, I think we can recondition ourselves. We can't, I don't think we can become completely free of these, these, um, these, these like phobias, but I think we can become a little more adapted and a little more conditioned, you know? So 
it's not like you're going to, all this stuff's just going to go away, but I think we can just, we can sort of develop a little more tolerance, a little more tolerance. And that's going to, I think, increase, improve our symptoms to the point, hopefully at least where we can still maybe have symptoms, but in the end, we might be a little more subclinical and, you know, subclinical is, is pretty good when you consider what NPD really is. So anyway, just an idea and, um, really appreciate your patience with this and thanks for watching.